Um, hi. Obviously, all of the recent cuts have come in under a Conservative government. Do you think we'll actually be any better off under a Labour government after the next election? I spoke with Sadiq Khan at the Labour Party conference the other day. He made a commitment on the JR uh, cuts, you know, which I thought was was the easiest option to do because they have, they're sort of going to be they're probably going to be thrown out by the court. <laughs> but you know, but ha didn't make a commitment on the other cuts that are coming through, and so we have to keep up the pressure to get them to come back to the 1949 position. But if you ask me, am I confident about that? I'm not confident because of the, all the things I talked about that they did in the last government was to give the police everything they want, which undermined legal aid in a different way. But at the same time, they've spoken at our rallies, and they, in general, they, they're very critical of grading, but in terms of when it comes to commitment for what they're going to do, we've had very, very little. And that's only going to come about, I think, through more pressure. And when these cases come up, these hideous cases, um, like the rights of women cases, that we, uh, we show this is what it's going to lead to, and, and make, put the pressure that way as well. So I'm not confident in putting it short. Yes, on that basis, I mean, the problem was, as I understand it, the figure work, I, I, I'm a legal aid solicitor, I do family work, and I've done family work as well, um, it, is that when the Labour government came into power, about 50% of the population were eligible for legal aid. By the time they left, it was down to 24%. So the way they cut was much more under the cover, it was much more quiet. What they did was they basically took, they didn't take stuff wholesale out of scope, which LASPO did, but what they did was they reduced eligibility. They, they, they brought in capital disallowances. And that, if you like, paved the way for the Conservatives to do what they did. Because they could then turn around and say, well, there's all this middle field who aren't eligible for legal aid. So we've got the people at the top who can pay for it. We've got the people at the bottom who get legal aid. It's not fair because the people in the middle don't. Um, so that was one of the aspects. But I agree with you. There's got to be pressure put in a huge amount of ways. The other thing is um, the way they've mucked up their budget. So, for example, the court services. I mean, that's the other thing in terms of family work. It now costs £415 to pay for a divorce if you want to go for divorce. You can get an exemption of fees, but you have to fill out a form and persuade the dragons at the courts that you can do that. I was there one day trying to sort out an application, and this poor chap was at the court waiting to try and speak to somebody, and he said, I'm an asylum seeker. I have no money. I have already given you a letter about this. I have walked two miles, I've walked two hours, no, not two miles, two hours to get here because I cannot afford. I'm very worried about my children. I want to issue this application. And they sent him away with a flea in his ear to say, um, oh, we'll, get you, we'll give you another five days to find some evidence for us. But they didn't tell him what the evidence was. Um, for example, you, we all now, if you get legal aid, you have to pay the court fee. So it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's, it's making you issue an application. It's wasting the time of the court staff. I mean, the amount of money that they must have wasted, the amount of judicial time in the family cases. Um, at last, I think this is another point, which I think is going to be important, the judges are starting to stand up. The judges are starting to do, obviously, the main cases, which we, we all know about, which, which they've done, but also in, in other family matters. They're, they're, well, they're brought in the 26 weeks. We to, um, um, the one bit of legal aid which does still exist is for parents and children in care proceedings. But if you are somebody else, a grandparent or someone like that, you've got to go through all the hurdles, and they will try and stop it, take away your legal aid. They're, again, they're unrepresented parties, even in care proceedings. Um, and, and they're looking at their statistics, and they're trying to drive it through. And obviously those of us who are still there, because we do still get some money for it, even though, again, talking about fixed fees, the Labour government brought in fixed fees for that as well. And uh, interestingly enough, we're now getting 33 and 3rd less fixed fee than we were in 2007, and 20% less on an hourly rate. So, you know, this is the whole time, and they keep looking at their stupid statistics and saying, oh, well, this isn't happening, and that isn't happening, because they're not collecting the statistics. Interestingly enough, LASCO is the most unintelligible document I have ever read to try and work out whether you're eligible or not. And the Legal Aid Board actually agreed with me because I went to the LAPG conference and there were quite a number of people from the Legal Aid Board who were very cautious about what they said, but effectively they agreed. And there's huge disagreements, and so, so there is still room for argument. But um, as, uh, it, to, to me, we all need to fight on all fronts. You know, the, 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 uh, obviously, you've got the LAPG, you've got the Criminal, London Criminal Solicitors Association, you've got the Law Society. 
uh, with Richard Miller and so on. Everybody's doing what they can do. We all just need to keep doing it and not get so drowned down by it that we feel we can't do anything. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what do you think the upshot will be of the responses to the consultation? Because many lawyers I've spoken to bother to respond uh, are quite pessimistic that it won't even get read and, uh, uh, and the cuts will, will push on regardless. Do you, do you agree with that viewpoint? And if so, what do you think should be done about that? And this is a consultation on current criminal defence. Very, very I've got lost on it. I uh, I'll explain it. It's a very good yeah. question. The, 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 this was at the result of the, the successful JR, where the government didn't disclose two economic reports, which would have formed the whole basis of how many big duty solicitor firms we should have. Um, and the judge was, was very good and said this is completely illegal. Indeed, we should know the basis so that the solicitors can debate. And in the course of the JR, there's a very embarrassing thing for a leading civil servant, his name is Gibby or Gibby, or Gibby, I think it is, who, who put in that statement, it would be, make no difference what the solicitor said, because we've made up our mind. And then the MOJ had to say, oh no, the, 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 the minister had to say, oh no, 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 that's not my position, so they did it, because they can't, they can't say that lawfully. Um, but to answer your question, there was, uh, as a result of the, the successful jail, they had a further consultation disclosing the two economic reports, one of which, as I say, is much more critical of the government, and that, and that has become much more critical now that this has happened, because he doesn't want to be uh, the one carrying the can for the rubbish system that they want to introduce that isn't going to work. Um, a lot of people have responded, more than last time. Uh, I was very pleased with the response, because we had a campaign to get in, not just lawyers, but the people outside, and Mapo, and Pound, and all sorts of people responded. Uh, I think there is a pressure on them to read them this time. I'm not, I'm not convinced they read the other ones. Um, and I think I know that there are lots of separate points that are being put in. They're going to be they're going to be uh, held to account on that because we've got copies. And the, the, the way it was done was really good because it went through a hub, and we've got copies of everything that went in, so we know whether they've addressed certain points or not. Um, I think it could go either way, actually. I really do. I think they, they're in a bit of a mess with this Otterburn, Mr. Otterburn, criticising the government, one of the original reports. And I think they might be really worried about, I think they've got problems with not setting up a further JR. Just try. Graham's position would be he wants to just carry on, because that's all he ever does. But he may be told that you can't do what you want to do, and it's not going to work. And if that's the case, then we might be successful. But I don't, I mean, I know that Grady wants to continue, so I'm ambivalent about it. I'm not, I'm not confident, put it that way, but I wouldn't be surprised if they told at this stage. So we'll have to wait and see. Or, well, we'll, we'll see, we'll have to wait and see. Really, they should fall legally, because they've got themselves in a total mess where they face all this on a, one of the economic reports doesn't support doesn't support what they want to do, so it doesn't make any sense logically. It's irrational. I mean, it's irrational now. You can see it's irrational, um, and so they should just follow the work we're going to see. Yeah. I know you have been mentioned of all these things in order to get us aware. <coughs> Does the lawyers have solution to solve this problem to avoid the, the government to do what they do? Sorry, say that again. The lawyers have a solution. You have a solution. Yes, to, you have read others. To the cuts to legal aid. Yeah. Well, that. <laughs> Can lawyers prevent the cuts to legal aid? Um, well, we've been trying. <laughs> I think we've stopped quite a lot. I think the residence test, I think it's been very difficult for them to, to overturn that, uh, that decision. I think we probably, I hope we will protect judicial review. Um, and we'll have to wait and see on criminal defence. If we don't uh, overturn the prison stuff and the criminal stuff, we're going to see a lot more Jerry Collins and we're going to see a lot more suicides in prison. Mm -hmm. So it's a very serious situation. But I'm, I, I, I'm optimistic we can, in one sense, but I, I also know we're up against a real uh, asset stripper who's very proud. He'll be moving on to another department, 
Um, but he, he, all he wants to say is, I cut, I cut this by 10% and I'm good at cutting. That's all he wants to do. Mm -hmm. So we're up against an idea on that. And we lost the last pro battle, it has to be said. Um, there was a campaign, not as big as the recent campaign that involved criminal defence lawyers, um, and there was pressure put on MPs and members of the House of Lords. There was a particular battle in the House of Lords because they were very receptive to the lobbying that was happening. But the fact is that the NASPO, as Matt said, went through taking away legal aid from all sorts of social welfare areas, including welfare benefits, which struck me as the most wicked aspect. Because by definition, if you need some legal advice about your welfare benefits, you cannot afford to pay for it. And we lost that. And as yet, I can't see those areas of legal aid coming back into scope. Um, I've got the chap at the back here. Naturally, down the front, forgive me, some of you I know, some of you I don't know, that's why I'm using this person. We'll take a round if that's all right, and then the chat here, and then I'll take another round of three. Yeah. Uh, back. So I would like to ask, uh, as we know, the junior vice uh, had a very important, the legal aid is very, is a very important for the junior criminal vice. So in the context of the prospective for the legal aid, would you recommend for the students, the law students, who want to be involved in and to be a criminal barrister? Involved in the, in the campaign? No, no, no. Uh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you saying, are you saying should people give up now? All right, that's We'll take three. Well, I just wanted to comment on the fact that I agree about the, it, it's purely an ideological uh, cut. There's no rationality or economic basis for really any of it. Um, you know, I was one of those sort of armies of paralegals in uh, criminal defence, particularly at the police station. And what you'd see is, you know, I think a th the, the statistic is a third of cases... Um, with the CPS aren't properly prepared, so you see adjournments, you see costs all the time. And now that I work at Brixton Advice Centre, where we do a lot of uh, housing possession, one of the few areas where there is still legal aid, what we're doing now, I think with Lambeth Law Centre, se Centre 70, a lot of the South London Advice Centres, we're actually collecting data about um, how many uh, possession proceedings are adjourned on the basis of the fact that housing benefit isn't calculated correctly, because constantly what you'll see is people whose benefits through no fault of their own have stopped or been incorrectly calculated and you know that's just leading to incredible costs coming back and, and that's what I see case after case so I mean we have one paid by the council at our advice centre but I don't know how many welfare benefits advisors are left in London I could probably count them on my one hand so it, it, it's just purely <laughs> ideological in nature and that's proven by the fact that it's probably going to cost the government a lot more <laughs> in terms of costs. And here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask um, Matt, is, is this um, happening in other countries? Are other countries um, restricting um, access to justice in this age of austerity? Or is Britain unique on that front? <laughs> OK, there's two questions there. The point is you want to deal with that as well. Yeah. What about aspiring criminal barristers? Is it all over for them? <laughs> well, I mean, a typical lawyer's question. The lawyer's answer is a fudge in a bit. But I, I, it does depend what happens. You know, it, it depends what happens in the next few months, really. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very tough time for the junior bar. It really, really is. And, and you worry not just for the junior bar, but the solicitors as well. You go to these meetings, and they, they get older and older and greyer and greyer as to who is going to be the new generation. But somebody has to be the new generation. It's just a question of whether it's affordable. In London, it's extremely difficult because of the cost of accommodation to get a start. Um, but it, it, it is a difficult time. But it really does depend whether we, whether we win or lose, I think. I and mean, I think if you've got uh, big factory firms being set up, there's every chance that they'll you know, that they'll resort to in-house advocates or, or not, um, you know, and, and they'll, they'll undermine the junior bar that way. Um, but it is very important, as you say, that we have people who are, I mean, the divide is a very good divide. I, I've always thought it's a very good divide to have advocates and people, solicitors who generally uh, prepare the cases more. 
um, because it's a particular skill advocacy and, it's, and it's a, it needs to remain a professional skill uh, that we protect. Uh, and there, are, you know, it can be a problem that, that people are. Uh, if, if we ignore that, it will lead to miscarriages in itself. If we don't have the right qualified people representing people on, on, on those different areas. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, but I just don't know about the other countries. Um, I think uh, I deal with people from time to time in Italy and France, and all I can say is that they seem to be better off, but I don't, I don't know much more than that. I mean, they have a very different system, obviously, mm -hmm. but it, uh, I think there is much more reliance on private work. Mm -hmm. I don't think that helps in those countries. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it can make it very difficult to find committed lawyers who protect people, maybe the standard is lower, but I, I, I just don't know. Part of the government's propaganda, of course, was that they said that we had the most expensive legal aid system, or whatever the equivalent word might be in other countries. In, I think, any country in the world, they looked at America and Commonwealth countries um, and Europe, and of course that was completely um, playing with statistics, wasn't it? Because they were taking out of that equation all the state funding that goes into state-employed lawyers and advocates. Whereas we have the bizarre situation that lawyers are all privately, private individuals, part of the private sector, running firms and so forth, but if you're committed to legal aid, you do, do, do so for, for claiming public money. Yeah, I mean, you're not comparing like with like, I mean, I've dealt with a case in Italy, which has gone on for forever. They're famous. Uh, Italian cases that in, in the European Court have constantly been told off with excessive delays. Um, and this case, a terrible case, actually, people who were, who were uh, assaulted very, very badly by the police after a demonstration in Genoa. And that case is still going on today, but we're going back from 2000. And it's just unbelievable. We're still waiting for the, the last few important bits of that case to come through. Um, so that's where the costs come in, 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 in court costs in, 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 the, in the European jurisdiction. So you can't compare life with life. Um, I just want to come back to the other just briefly because it sparked off the theme. And I totally agree with the, the, the way that Labour Cup was slightly more, you know, uh, bit slice by slice. And I, I think we should never forget, because I think he may stand for mayor, but David, it was David Lammy that reintroduced the means testing for criminal legal aid which is a disgraceful thing. I always wrote about it at the time. But, uh, he always goes on about he's born and bred from Tottenham. But if you're a black man in Tottenham and get harassed by the police or stopped by the police, accused of doing something you haven't done, and you happen to be working, then you're not going to be eligible for legal aid. And that's exactly what he's, he's set up, the completely unnecessary. But the only other point I want to make is that we, we, we need to remember the other side, that, that Grayling is vulnerable. You know, because he's so out on a limb, and I think he's one prison right away from from a, from a resignation, you know, because he says there's nothing wrong in the prisons, but everybody says there's something wrong with the prisons. The prison inspector, uh, how the, the, the prison governors, everybody says there's a serious crisis going on in the prison, says there's nothing wrong. And so there is a big riot, which I would obviously not encourage publicly if there was, it would be, it, it could easily be anything. So it's not like he's all purple. All right, more hands? Rob, Rob, there. Rob, 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 uh, 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 you painted about legal aid. It's, it's very, very pessimistic, isn't it? It's, it's, it's quite, it's quite depressing. And I think it's important to remember, really, that law follows politics. I mean, I teach equality law. And one of the things I say about equality law is, if it wasn't for the fact that Rosa Parks refused to sit at the back of the bus, then Brown versus the school board would never have happened. And it, 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 so, I, you know, I think what's important, and, and actually, what is so shocking about what's happening, not just in law, but in every area of our lives, is how unpopular government policies are amongst the, the, the most people, but, and, and, and they manage to get away with it. 
And the, 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 the crucial thing I think that's happened in the last year, I think that when the, the, when the, 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 the protests around legal aid led by London lawyers earlier in the year were fantastically popular. And, uh, and, and I think we need to see more of that. So I think that what we need to do is, okay, so we're not prisoners, we can't riot. But we can support the, the lawyers in what they that, in, in what they are doing, and, and I think every time a group of people stand up and fight against what this government is doing, it's very very popular. And I think what all of us can do, you know, let's think of them all as Rosa Parks. Let's get behind everybody that stands up and fight back. All of us have to get behind them and support them. And we need to spread the word. Let's make trouble. We can't make a riot. <laughs> <laughs>
course, what matters, really important, is the Haldane Society played at pivotal points, both in terms of bodies and in terms of discussions and strategy, a key role in developing the campaign against cuts in legal aid. And as um, Nancy said at the front, it's very clear this is an ideological attack on the, on the welfare state. It's not, it's not, it's not a pound, shoes and pence thing for the government. It's an ideological attack on the rights of working class people to secure, to secure their rights. And I think it's important to remember that throughout, even in the recent history, uh, picking up what Rob said, is that people have made a difference. The poll tax campaign started off in Scotland, built up a, a mass campaign of millions not paying, and managed not only to get rid of the poll tax, but get rid of Thatcher as well. That's going back a few years for many of the people here, but was a pivotal moment in society. And for those who are new and thinking, Christ, that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to qualify as a lawyer and this is looking pretty grim. I, I would say, you know, the, the, the fight isn't, isn't given up. We've got an election coming up. The Tories are on the ropes on many things. The shame is, of course, that our Labour Party no longer speaks for working class people anymore. And, you know, that's a, for a separate discussion. But certainly for all the new people here, I would say don't give up hope. And certainly if you definitely want to get involved in fighting the legal aid cuts, then there's no better place than get involved in the Haldane Society. You don't have to be a lawyer to join. You can, we've got trade unionists, we've got barristers, we've got solicitors, we've got campaigners. And, we've, and some of our most active members were former law students. So the campaign isn't lost yet. We, you know, we're still you know, cooking up strategies and looking at ways. And I'd certainly appeal to those people who are here. It's not all. It is doom and gloom a little bit, but we are building the fight back as well. And I think it's important to get involved in that. Yeah. and then ask Matt to come back at the end. So there was a sister there. Uh, my name is Benita Kingale. I'm an immigration case worker. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to become a solicitor. Uh, I work for a very big uh, legal aid firm in London. Uh, and um, and I, I just want to share my experience about uh, uh, what it means to, to justify your work uh, to the legal aid agency. I mean, if I have to claim, uh, if today I did an extension for costs because, for example, uh, a fixed fee for an, for an asylum claim is, is £416. And uh, with £416, you cannot really assist the client, you know, because uh, it's too little money. Uh, one hour of my work, my, my employer is, is paid £52. <coughs> and I uh, for one hour of my work, and uh, uh, my salary is nine hundred pounds a month. Um, which I'm, I mean, I'm really happy. I'm really enjoying my work, and I am I'm getting, getting a lot of experience. You know, it's, it's fantastic to work with people who need help. You know, I mean, uh, uh, it's a privilege to have people that are so in terrible situations. You know, in immigration, working in immigration, I mean. Uh, Every area of the law is, uh, you know, there is people who uh, need to act. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I did an extension for cost today, and uh, it's not very easy to get uh, an, an, uh, an upper cost limit uh, accepted from the legal aid agency. And um, I can claim uh, 18 minutes to do that extension for cost. And if I want to do a good job, it takes me around an hour of my work, you know? And maybe I get some fuel. So what I'm saying is um, it's difficult, you know, uh, to, to get money out of the environment, uh, to, to help the people that need help. Mm. Yeah, so I think, yeah, like everybody else is sharing here, is uh, that the very, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's more and more difficult to, to have the means to, to have people, and uh, that is uh, really, really unfair. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe one more point for this one? A question? All right, well, I'll ask that. that so that, we've, we've just heard a number of terms of woe <laughs> about how difficult it is for lawyers actually to do a proper professional job given. The, um, the low pay that legal aid pays, and Rianne um, and the sister sitting next to her very clearly explaining 
just have you a crash of your tears dealing with the legal aid agency and how everybody can get ground down and nobody's being paid very well. So is it all over? Are there going to be no more legal aid lawyers in the future? Tell us something good about legal aid and why um, people should still think about coming into legal aid. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Liz. I mean, I, I, I want to agree with Rob and, and Paul at the back. We, we, we have achieved a, a hell of a lot in the last year. Um, and we had, a, we had a strike, which was extraordinary, which um, has stopped Graham and made, and made him come to a sort of deal with the barristers. Uh, and has not, uh, the, the issue has not gone away. And I am, I am I'm, well, I'm very proud that we've stopped quite a lot. I, I think we can stop what he wants to do as criminal legal aid. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic in that way. I think, I think there's everything to play for. And I do think the Magna Carta celebrations are going to be quite a focus because the, the contrast between celebrating the Magna Carta and what they were trying to do is so perverse that I think most people in the public will, will think that's, that's ridiculous. Um, in terms of people here, students who are um, partly wait and see. I, I wouldn't want to rush off and, and see how it goes. But it is very important that, it be, that there are committed people in the future um, who, who look after people. And I, I sort of agree with what we've just been saying. Of course, it's difficult, but we do play a very important role in protecting people. And it's very fulfilling when you can stop um, someone being prosecuted when they shouldn't be prosecuted, or someone stop them going to prison when they shouldn't go to prison, or someone get the sentence when they should, you know, all the different issues we have to deal with, with mental health or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, yesterday, I'll just finish on this, I was slightly uh, uh, to go to court for, for someone who was in a, it was a very unfortunate person because he happened to have been arrested by by the Commissioner of Police, who was wandering around London filming himself, proving himself, and, and a taxi driver had come up and said, someone's just run away from my taxi. And then the whole media is going on about this poor man who just happened to run away from a taxi at 20 pound fare. And you just don't know what you're going to expect at court because there's been a whole media about him and what he's going to face. And um, the guy who rides on crutches he's never been to court before. Uh, 19 year old lad who's, who's, who's um, you know, had very, very, very limited education. And I was very pleased that we not only did you know, manage to get a conditional discharge, but, but also that I was quite pleased, if I'm saying to myself, which <laughs> managed to use the fact that the commissioner stopped him as, a, as an advantage for his case, that he shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be held against that the commissioner had arrested him and he should be treated as if any police officer had arrested him. And I, I think I managed to hopefully frighten the magistrates so much that they gave him the initial discharge. So we can make a difference all the time and he can um, get on his life without having to do something because community order because, because the commissioner uh, has unfortunately arrested him uh, by chance. But I, I think all the time, I, I, would, I, mean, I would encourage people to, to do it but just know that you're you're going in, um, and it, it's going to be difficult for you, but you can really make a difference to people's lives. All right. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Natalie, tell us more about the feminist subgroup. Okay. Um, I mean, Liz introduced it before. Um, I'm, I'm from the house. Shout, Natalie. Yeah, I'll speak up. Yeah, <laughs> up. So I've lost my voice from a cold. Um, I'm. I've formed the Housing Feminist Lawyers, which we started last year. Uh, we run, the main thing that we do is we run a reading group, actually funnily enough, it's just around the corner that we, we run them at, um, it's called the London Action Resource Centre, it's on Fieldgate Street, um, in between here and Whitechapel Station, um, we're currently reading, yeah, Borderline Justice, so not only are we feminists, we're um, intersectional, so fight uh, all forms of oppression, and this one in particular is, is about the immigration system. Um, we've done two sessions already, but if you want to join, um, our next one is on Monday. You can either go on our website to see or chat to me. We also do campaigns and info sharing and things like that. So um, it's 6.30 on next Monday for the next session, um, and talk to me if you want more information.
Thank you. And you can find out about everything that the Holbein Society is doing. We haven't put it up for you, but our website address is www.holbein.org, and it's, it, is, it is on that banner that I'm not allowed to touch. Sorry, can I add, you don't, have to be a, you don't have to be a member of the Haldane Society to be part of the Haldane Feminist Lawyers, though we do encourage it. Yeah, so more information about the feminist suffrage on our website, and as Natalie says, you don't have to be a member to come either to that or to our lecture. Oh, or a woman, sorry. Or a woman, <laughs> either kind of woman, either kind of woman. But we'd like it if, um, as a woman, you thought about coming along. <laughs> now then, um, Haldane Society will meet here again in four weeks' time, which is... Um, the Wednesday the 19th of November when, as I said at the beginning, we will have John McDonnell MP talking about the demise of justice from a political and parliamentarian point of view and we very much hope that you will join us again for that. And then our third lecture of this term will be on the 3rd of December talking about the legal cases related to the anti-cracking protest movement. Before you go, can I remind you that you can buy copies of Socialist Lawyer um, from us tonight, or you can join tonight and you'll get a copy of, of our magazine, Socialist Lawyer, free, so please do come up at the end and have a look at it. Please also take these postcards. There's a load here. Matt doesn't want to take them home with him. These are the postcards <laughs> explaining the Justice Alliance and giving the, le the links to the YouTube show that features Stephen Fry and also to the petition. So please do come and take handfuls of these and give them to all your colleagues and fellow students and so forth. And then finally, <coughs> can I just ask you to thank Matt for all the time, effort and brilliant time.